where we left you was right here on this notion that we have uh, the idea that we want to create some search sets. We want to be able to kind of select some things out of the model, but that by trying to go through and just define them using the find items, it could be a little bit difficult to do that. So I wanted to try to see if we could come up with a better way to do that, because find items will work if we can go through and define different categories of elements and properties that we're interested in searching for and conditions. We can define things, but let's see if we can actually make our life a little bit easier by encoding some information to make our life work well just right from the start. So let's take a look at really, let's you know, back off and think about really what we're trying to accomplish. Ultimately, you're trying to basically get all the different columns associated with some task ID or some task, and I gave it an ID just because it makes it easy for me to refer it that way. You're trying to get all the level B1 beams associated with an ID. You're trying to get all the level one joists associated with an ID. Okay? And the deal is you're actually pretty good at figuring out where the beams and the columns and the joists are, whereas Navisworks is having a little bit hard time doing that mapping. So if we can go ahead and use your intelligence to actually tell it which things, which elements to map to which task IDs, it'll actually make your life a whole lot easier. You know, as opposed to sort of trying to work through the back door and come up with a set of criteria to define it, if you just manually say these should belong to that task ID, it'll actually probably make your life a little bit simpler. So let's show you how you could do that. Here's the deal. We're back over in Revit structure. And the idea, or one of the nice things about Revit or any building information modeling environment, any platform that does this, is ultimately it's really just a database. It's all really just a big database of the different elements. And although we manipulate them graphically and we do all these kind of groovy 3D things with them, ultimately it's a database of information. And the nice thing about databases is you can add columns and fields as you need to kind of really sort out the information however you need to. So let's think about how we could actually use that. There's this, for example, this column over here sitting around on the first floor level. It has all these different properties associated with it, many of which, in fact, all of which I can go ahead and grab out at Navisworks. It sure would be nice if I actually had a field over here where I can map the task ID to that element and just do it right over here. Okay? You say, but oh, but there isn't one of those things. I don't have any sort of field that is available for me to map the task ID. But the secret is you can create that if you want it. And let's show you how you do that. Okay, All these different elements have data associated with them. If you want to go through and associate some new information, whether it's construction sequencing information or construction ordering or location on the site information or some sort of structural information or even R values that you want to associate with the different wall assemblies, you can do all that stuff. You can add data values to track whatever you want to in the database. So how that works is as follows. On the Manage tab, we have a couple of different things over here, shared parameters and project parameters. Let's talk about the difference. Project parameters are parameters that we're going to add to the elements in our project. So you know, we've always had the ability, when I've added values and calculated values and done things in schedules, I've been sort of messing around adding some parameters very informally. But I can add parameters to each of these different elements. So I can add a task ID parameter. If I add a task ID parameter as a project parameter, that's OK, but it won't be exported to other programs. It only exists within this project. If I make it a shared parameter, then it'll actually be exportable, and we can take it out to databases or take it over to Navisworks or wherever we want it to go. So I'm going to start by creating a shared parameter and then associate it with those elements. And how you do that is I choose shared parameters. And let me go through and create. That was for session two. I'm going to create a new shared parameters file. The shared parameters file is really just a header. It's just a text header that's going to explain which values I've added. So I have a new shared parameter file. That's really, again, just text headers that's going to describe the different columns. And we need that around just so we uh, can transfer the information between the different programs. Okay, There are groupings and then specific parameters we want to add. And I'm going to start by adding a uh, group of parameters, a, a group that I'll call construction. Okay, That's just an overall heading of the different parameters I'm going to add. Then I'm going to add one specific parameter to the construction group. I'm going to one, add one called 4D task ID. Okay, And you can add as many as you want to. I guess I say 4D task ID. 
And I can add some other ones in there too. I can, for example, add, oh, you know, the order status, which will be a text field. I can add the whole delivery status. I can go through and add one that's called, oh, like a temporary storage location. So as material comes in on site, we could actually keep track of where it's actually located on its way to being installed. So I can add as much data as I like. Say OK. First step was just setting them up as values that can be assigned and transferred. Now we actually have to do the step of assigning them to the values or the elements, and that's under project parameters. So I can say, parameters available to elements in this project. Let me add, and I'll add some of our shared parameters. So then it'll give me that list that I just created. And I'll go for that 4D task ID. Now 4D task ID, which is a piece of text, I like it as a piece of text because then I can say 120A, 120B, 120C. Text is pretty flexible. Okay, I have the choice, is it an instance or a type parameter? Think about whether you want to be able to change this value for every individual item or whether you only want to change the entire class at the same time. I'm going to be able to assign every individual column and beam separately. So I make an instance. You could also choose whether you want to group it. Grouping is just really where it'll show up in that dialog box. Other shows up way at the bottom. I often put things under identity data that'll show up a little bit higher. You kind of just sort of choose where you want to see it. Okay, the last thing you get to decide is really what type of elements this will apply to. So for the different elements, you could check all, and then there'd be a 4D task ID for all the different elements. You could do that. There's really not much harm in it. You know, for some things like loads and point loads and line loads, they don't really have task IDs in the same sense. So if you want to get more refined, you can. It's kind of better practice to only apply it where you need it. So maybe I'll get these structural elements. Maybe something like that. I might also want to get the walls and the floors and the roof and things like that. But think about really where it makes sense to apply it. You don't necessarily want to sort of apply it everywhere. That's just kind of bad form after a while. And you hate to have people start putting values in on things where it doesn't really make sense to do it. So be a good modeler and go ahead and only choose the ones that you want. So I'm just choosing that for the structural elements there. Let me do the reinforcement too. Yeah, stairs, why not? Say okay. Say okay. Now, nothing appears to have changed, but something has changed, you just don't see it. And that is if you go through and choose one of the elements now that you just associated it with and say instance properties, you actually now have a field that you can use. Okay. So we can go through and put the values in there. So what are we going to do? At a high level, what we're going to do is as follows. We're going to go through and working with this listing as our guideline, go through and find all those first level columns and call them task 120. Find all those first level beams and call them task 130. Find all those joists and associate them with 140, because that'll be really easy for us to search and associate with the different tasks. Okay, You can set it up a lot of different ways, but if you can just map them right to the task, that's going to be the easiest for you in the long run. So let's come back over to the structure and show you how you do that. So I got that first column there. I can go through and change that. And I decided my uh, columns were going to be 120. So I could go through and put that in there as 120. I could go through and grab that column, or maybe even this column 2, or maybe that column 3. And I'll make those all 120. I can do a whole bunch at the same time. but. As usual, whenever I'm doing something like that and it seems really inefficient, I'll say there's a better way to do it. So, and one thing that we are getting, starting to get good at is the whole notion of selecting and filtering things. So, for example, if you think about a view where you can see all the different elements, like the first floor view, I could go through and select all those elements and then do a filter so that if, for example, I wanted to get all the foundations, that just has all the foundation elements. I want to associate those all with ID 110. So I can associate them with uh, 110 right here. I'm going to go through and get all the columns now and do the filtering again, checking none to first select them off, and then go through and get the columns. OK. 
Okay, and then I'll map those into 120. Yes, go ahead, Mike. Uh, quick question on the filtering. Is there, is there a way to do a little more precise filtering and say I want the columns that are going to be 12 by 40 pixels, like uh, have it filtered by more the next level down? That, as far as I know, there isn't as a filter. We could go ahead, well, I take that back. There's the filtering over here. At that level, no. We could go through and construct a view. Let me show you that. Where in visibility graphics, you can set up filters where you can create filters that have, oh, like W10 columns. And we can say, oh, I only want to get the columns. Let's see if we, what we have available. Okay, it looks like it has all those same values. So you can construct a view that'll do it. Oh, okay. Okay, and that's not too bad either. Okay, mm -hmm. but yeah. Oddly, that looks very much like the, it looked over in Navisworks. It's, it's really, it's all the same values. Mm -hmm. So if it's a data value, you have access to it. So I can get the columns, I can get the foundations. For the beams, we could go ahead and select those. And the key to this is always thinking about the view that actually enables you to grab things the easiest. For the beams, if I want to get all the beams on level two, or at the top of level one, I can go to the level two view and look down, or like if I had a ceiling plan view, I could go to level one and look up. Kind of just take your pick about which way works easier. I'm going to go to level two since that view is already set up. I'll choose all that framing. I'll do a little filtering and say, let me grab all the girders. Okay, That's all of those elements what I think of as being the beams. So now I can change all those, and they're going to be the 130 task. Where'd they go? There it is. And then I'll grab all the uh, joists. And I'll say filter those again. And I'll just grab all the joists. And I'll make all those the 140s. Now, there's nothing magical about these numbers that I'm using. All you have to do is sort of work out as a project team, really, what numbers you're going to use in the schedule and what numbers you want to work out, work on in the model. And this is one of those things where typically you'd set this up early in the project. In the same way you set up a work breakdown structure for how you associate things as estimating items, you need to sort of set up a schedule structure and really how you want to map things so does people model. They can go through and associate things with the appropriate activities, or you can add these in later. But we want to do something like that. Let me go through, and I'll do a couple more in here. For example, oh, let me get those guys. This is sort of an inefficient way of selecting them, but it'll sort of work. Did I get it? I know even in here, let me actually go through and fix something. I have, an, I have a modeling error here in case uh, you haven't spotted it yet. Where I have, well, no, that's actually didn't look too bad. I can say I have a modeling error, maybe I don't. Okay, those three right there. Let me go through and take a look at their properties. That's gonna be second floor. Level two, oh, I see. I kind of modeled it in an interesting way. Eh, I'll live with that. Okay, uh, but I will say that those are all going to be associated with the columns on the second floor, so they're 220. Then I'm going to copy those and paste them aligned up to the higher level and bring up to level four. Wow, there you go. That happens to me. Whichever way I assume, it's always the opposite of the way I assume. That's a general truism. Actually, they're still out there on the clipboard. Let me do paste the line. I'll bring them to level three. There we go. Now for these, as opposed to being on level two, let me change them so they're associated with a level three, so it'd be 320. But again, there's nothing magical about these numbers. As long as you have some sort of structure that makes sense, you're just associating things. Okay, so the big trick with all this is go to manage. Set yourself up with a shared parameter that gives you the ability to do the mapping the way you want it. So shared parameters and set up some sort of task ID. Add some value where you need it.
For project parameters, go ahead and associate that with the elements that you want to be able to associate that with. But start taking control of your data. You're allowed to go ahead and add as much data as you want to. It's your data, so go ahead and make your life easier for how you need to model things. Don't just settle with what comes out of the box. Okay, what is this all bias in the tail end? Let's show you. We will go back to add-ins, and I'll do my export. I'll export it to Navisworks again. And I should probably go through and make sure I'm on the right view that actually is ready for exporting it, just to make sure I'm getting everything. I will export it to Navisworks. I will say that it's going to be Office Structural with IDs Class 3D. How's that for a descriptive name? Say OK. Save it away. Those 814 elements will come across again, but this time those 814 elements are going to contain that task ID that we're going to be able to use. Okay, I'm ready to go back over to Navisworks and let's take a look at what it actually did. I'll hide that away for right now. Back to Navisworks, and here we are again. <laughs> 